Uh, Barbara is part of the Carex Working Group and uh, co author of Carex, uh, or Field Guide Ascendant of the Pacific Northwest. And uh, we hope that there will be a, a California um, version of that uh, book coming out soon. And um, Barbara is also going to uh, talk about um, CDM subjects for me. this from a uh, morphological point of view, which is certainly a confusing point of view, but we have um, achieved some idea of what's going on, and I'm urging our members to uh, declare victory and get out quickly before the <laughs> action happens. Yes. Um, we are the Carex Working Group, and we've worked with a whole lot of friends. Let's see. This is the Carex Working Group. Seated there is uh, Peter Zika, um, our friend who's been deeply involved with this. We also were lucky enough to make contact with Stephen Darrington from Arcata, who has been to like all the sedum populations in Northwest California. He sent us to lots of interesting places, uh, directed us to very confusing plants, and he's been an amazing source of information. Um, we also worked, of course, with Julie Nelson, who started this project and who we viewed as a friend, but do friends get friends into things like seeds? <laughs> I'm not sure. Her question was deceptively simple. She was finding more sedum section, um, sedum paradisum than seemed reasonable since it was considered a rare plant, but the keys were difficult to interpret. Was it misidentification or what was going on. Looked like a simple one year study, which we started in 2011. Yes. Uh, many organizations became involved, including Arcata, BLM, lots of national forests, um, North State Resources that Jane Van Susteren worked with, and a list of over 30 people who, um, and I hadn't updated the list, so um, I didn't include it because I didn't want to exclude anyone if you've been helping, you know who you are, and we really appreciate it. We've gotten some amazing records. The usual thing, of course, would be to consult herbarium specimens in a question like this, and as Jane said, uh, they tend to look like this. It's very difficult looking at that to envision that the plant really looks like this, isn't it? So we traveled all over for four years in the uh, Northern California, mostly, and um, we took thousands of photos. The good news is, if you take the right set of photos, you can probably identify these without ever collecting them. Um, or at least you have as good a chance as if you do. Um, we grew them in the greenhouse, we grew them in the garden. Most of our specimens that survived are now at the Berkeley Botanic Garden, where I hear they are recovering nicely from my horticultural skills. <laughs> Four years of field work means, of course, four years of lab work, and we took a lot of measurements. We have data. Uh, we don't entirely know what it means because we have a lot of holes in the data set. We're still working on it, but that hasn't stopped us. We interrogated our plants closely, <laughs> and we came to some conclusions, the main conclusion of which is we usually have and sedges, and there's a good reason for that. <laughs> ask us to work with pretty flowers, there's a problem. <laughs> the smaller problem is that it turns out, you, know, you see these beautiful flowers, you want to use their colors to identify them, and the colors of petals, anthers, filaments, and follicles all change with both maturity and environmental conditions. Now once you learn how they change, you can actually use this, but it confused us, to say the least. The more basic biological problem is that these things grow on rock outcrops. And rock, rock outcrops are not a continuous habitat. They form little habitat islands. And sedum section gourmania seem to have very poor seed dispersal. Poor seed dispersal plus habitat islands means that the local populations diverge. Sometimes you can even tell plants from two adjacent ridges which one they came from. You get a lot of discontinuous variation and incipient speciation. And when you've got speciation just in its early days, do you call them all one thing or do you split them? We saw a lot of variation. We didn't want to call it all one thing. But what do we do? 
We might try to apply the biological species concept where a species is a group of individuals that breed together but don't breed with other groups. They're reproductively isolated from each other. It doesn't work well because all tested <coughs> sedum section gourmania taxa that have the same chromosome number can interbreed. And the offspring are, are fertile. And if they have different chromosomes, they can still produce offspring that are mostly sterile, as in sometimes not. So that, that's just out. But this is familiar to you because you work with plants. You know they don't cooperate with our definitions. So should we call these all one species? As you look at those photos, do you think those look like one species? No, we want to name them. They're different, but where do we stop? <laughs> well, and the ability to interbreed is an ancestral condition, and plants and animals sometimes don't lose it as they speciate for quite a long time. So, we're going to name these things, yes. <clears throat> so we had to have our own species concept, which after we worked with these for a while, we discovered that if the sedum look more or less alike and they have a coherent geographic range, they're the same species. So we named these things. Yep. Okay. <laughs> and when we were done, we had 17 taxa within sedum section gourmania, what I now know is subsection eugormania. So if we included spatulifolium and uh, organum, we'd be at 19. But we're at 17 of these. New species, change species ranks, we had fun. How does this compare to the work of previous researchers? Well, Clawson seemed to have 11 total taxa, Denton 12, we have 17, which would disturb us a lot more, except that we know that at least three, probably four of these, are taxa that Denton and Clawson never saw. And one of them is something that Denton saw and said, this is really weird, but I've only got one of it, and put it in something else. What we differ mostly is in how we rank things. Um, Clausen and Denton rec recognize relatively few species with a lot of subspecies. We go the other way. Why do we do that? Well, if you're saying two things are subspecies of the same species, you're saying they're more closely related to each other than they are to members of other species. So you're making a statement about relationships. And we thought about relationships. <laughs> <laughs> and we were confused, so we just said to hell with that and call them all species. <laughs> so we do have names. As I go through the names, I'm also going to discuss rarity a little bit. There are only two sedum section gourmania that you could reasonably, uh, subsection eugormania, that you could reasonably call common. Sedum oregonense and sedum obtusatum the real sedum obtusatum, whose name has been massively over-applied. Um, all the others are rare in one way or another. Um, do they have few populations or many? How big are those populations? What's the thing's total range? All con contribute to rarity. So now I want to go through this parade of the sedum section gourmania species. But first, the part that my uh, partners, business partners will shoot me if I don't mention, um, well, figuratively. Um, the, we are writing a field guide to the Crashulaceae, the stone crops and their allies in Washington, Oregon, and Northern California. Uh, we've got a draft of the text. We've got a draft of the pictures. We're working well along on it. Um, we know we can accomplish it because we've done it before. Field guide to the Sedges, Pacific Northwest. You all want to buy a copy. Second edition's out now. Covers two thirds of California sedges. Has the same format we're going to use in the other one. Each species gets a page of text and a page of um, pictures, and there's an identification key. So, um, please help me make my backpack lighter. Okay, buy one. Thirty-five dollars cash or check. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, uh, we plan to publish our crash lacey guide this year. It's going to cover everything from Dudleya to um, Crashula, which is why it only includes Northern California. 
because the Dudley Center diversity is in Southern California. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be beautiful. You're going to want to get one. And so you're going to be real receptive to our fundraising to help get it published. Yeah. So, Sedum Section Gourmania, Subsection U Gourmania, 17 taxa, and here's one of them. Sedum Paradisum, which we are calling Subspecies Paradisum, which is the original question. Um, is it really rare? Well, yes, but not as rare as it was thought, and it has a cousin, or at least we thought it was a cousin until I saw Jane's um, phylog phylog phylogeny tree, maybe it's not. Well, this can be a hard plant to find because of its battleship gray um, leaves out on the gray rocks, but it's out there, and for a member of this group, it has a large range occurring in both Shasta and Trinity counties. Um, the populations are usually small, but there are quite a number of them. If you go to the northern Sierra Nevada, you found a, find a plant that's similar in many ways, has the white or off-white flowers, the gray leaves. Uh, the flowers have a tendency to go very pink with age. We wanted to call it a different species. Um, Denton considered it a different species from Paradisum. It looks like a different thing in Jane's phylogeny. But if you go and make a key to separate things, this thing from Paradisum, the only thing you can use is range, which is enough, I think, but it doesn't convince reviewers of scientific papers. OK, so that's one problem. Now, back up in Julie's range, um, there was another plant that was getting confused with Paradisum. Um, the disjunct population you see mapped there on Mount Shasta, we believe it's gone, thanks to the big mud avalanche that went through there this summer. But otherwise, um, this is, you know, like not a globally common plant, but you can find it in numbers up there in the mountains along the edge of Trinity County. We named it Julie, uh, we named it Cedum Kirstedii after Julie Kirsted Nelson. Yes, and it's characterized by these spreading yellow petals and loose rosettes. Julie also sent us to a site in Tehama County where we found a plant that is in some ways similar, but it's much more robust, has more flowers. We kind of think there's some ploidy level thing going on, and has very dense rosettes. We named that Cedum rubiginosum, two known populations, uh, but at least one of them is quite large. The real Cedum obtusatum lives in the Sierra Nevada south of the Yuba River. It goes down to Fresno County. Cute little yellow stone crop, often on granite. And the petals flare a little bit. And it's a really dinky little plant. And I point out this because back in the uh, coast range, the southern Klamath, you find a plant that Everything you say about it makes it sound identical, but it's so not. And the one thing you can really talk about is that the flowers petals don't flare. Those inflorescences all include completely ad anthesis flowers that are attracting lots of bees and flies and butterflies. Um, uh, Jane, Sedum sanhedrinum is the one that is in your study as Sedum obtusatum subspecies retusum. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, and this isn't one we named. This is resurrecting an old species name for it that got neglected. Um, Peter Zika worked with us, and I think he spent altogether too much time in Del Norte County, <laughs> where he found this yellow thing. Superficially, it looks like Kirstedii, but has flat topped. Um, inflorescences, not columnar at all, and differences in the leaves. And besides, it's really disjunct, and sedum section gourmania really doesn't do that, as far as we can tell. Sedum citrinum, new population. Um, all the populations are in about 10 square miles, but some of them have thousands of plants. It's common where you find it and nowhere else. Now, if you go over into the next watershed, or the one after that, I forget, you find something that has much more pointy leaf petals that are white and has some differences in the leaves. And um, 
Steve Darrington independently found it last summer and said, whoa, you got to look at this. And as it happened, just uh, a week later, um, Peter was in the same place. They both agree it's really odd. Okay, Cita Morganense um, goes north to Mount Hood, all through the Cascade Range. <laughs> And it does occur in California, perhaps more, uh, we think more than originally reported. It's not common, but I wouldn't call it really, really rare here, and goes down to the Siskiyou-Trinity County line. And in California, it tends to be a little weird, more cream-colored petals sometimes, even yellow in the caribou basin. And I have five minutes left, okay. So it's variable, usually white, sometimes looks yellow even when it's white. Very open rosettes characterize it. Variable stem leaf shape, which is too bad because stem leaves seem to be about as good a character as there is in this group. And if we have correctly identified the plants that Denton counted chromosomes on, it's rarely diploid, usually uh, tetraploid or hexaploid. <coughs> Variable. Somebody could study this, but if you value your sanity, you probably shouldn't. <laughs> Other interesting Gormania down in the Feather River Canyon and um, Yellow Creek, a tributary of the Feather River. We, and one site north of there, just found uh, this year, um, Cedum alba marginata. Beautiful plant, fairly robust, fairly uh, lanceolate leaves, and characterized by waxiness that just comes off in your hand when you handle it. Really, really excessively waxy. Another plant that has that same character is Cedum oblanceolatum on the California Oregon border. This one's globally rare and the populations are few and small. This is the one we have that fits all the characteristics. Um, white petals instead of yellow, very oblanceolate leaves. Look at those rosette leaves. And especially because of what I'm going to show you next. <coughs> which is something you find in the Marble Mountains and to the east, limited range, small populations, except in the Marble Mountains where they're big. Um, has really different rosette leaves. It tends to have too much waxiness, so it comes off in your hand, but it's not nearly as waxy as the others. Um, personally, I think this is the squishiest of our uh, new taxa, but it really doesn't fit any of our other categories, so what the hell. As you move further south, we get into the Laxum complex with Cedum flavidum, um, a white flowered or pale yellow flowered thing that has round leaves most of the time, that's variable in um, color from white to pink to, you know, they're always mostly white or light yellow, but they may be heavily marked with pink or red. It's a beautiful plant. Variable stem leaves, though they're always more or less short. Interesting color variants. Sometimes kind of ghostly and very confusing. To its north along the uh, state line, we have Cetum laxum, which has been divided into three subspecies. And I fought long and hard for them to be recognized, but I finally had to admit we couldn't tell some of the intermediates. And in fact, the plants from the Cetum latifolium type locality look like Cetum laxum rather than latifolium, so what the hell? Put them all together. Sorry about that. Um, or maybe that's good news. So there's laxum laxum, with, which is a robust plant with decurrent leaves. Latifolium, a robust plant with very thick water storing leaves and perplexum, the coastal entity, which is small. Cetum laxum subspecies Hechnera is my very, very favorite. Beautiful yellow flowers. The stem leaves are not only round, but usually reflexed. I think it's beautiful. And it's the only member of the group that regularly colonizes road cuts. Most of them will accept only natural rock outcrops. They won't take road cuts. And down in Mendocino County, um, we have Cedum East Woodyi, an absolutely beautiful little plant, recently rejected for, um, for threatened species listing, but it is um, not because it isn't rare. It's located on two mountains that are adjacent to each other. The populations are not big, 
and there's very few of them, but the plant is stable and it's administratively protected, so they rejected it. So, I reached the end, believe it or not. Jim. Um, as far as we can tell, there are no serum section gourmania there. And um, th there's a big kind of hole between Subrosium and Obtusatum in the Sierra Nevada and all the rest of them. But there's Mount Lassen in there. And we think that the eruptions or just the, the dry volcanic soil were just too bad. Uh, the sedum couldn't handle it. So it, it may have been a continuous distribution at one time across there recently. <coughs> Relatively recently destroyed, yes. Go ahead. Uh, is there a substrate things going on with some of these caps? Well, the, traditionally we have really thought that they are substrate specific, but I think that what it is is that they're location specific. They don't disperse well, and in a given, and, and they can't take competition. So in one area, the places without competition are mostly serpentine, and they live on serpentine, but even the supposed serpentine endemics can live on other soils. So I, I don't think they are, in fact, restricted. I think they're very tolerant of bad soils. And so, and they need lack of competition. Yes? This, this could be totally out of ignorance, but uh, Sedum spathiofolium has this amazing geographic range, and it would seem that we would have some of the same problems getting around and, uh, <clears throat> you know, limited size of habitat as the other ones in discontinuous habitat. How come it's one thing and 